The question is, why must we take this with utmost seriousness? Because the mass media, the great organizations, the various sorts of workers, the governing and educational institutions, including philosophy, have failed to recognize that the Earth is deterritorialized, that it's a point in a galaxy among 200 billion times 10 galaxies. And so they've become machines for the reproduction of ideas, ideologies, positions, and powers. Deleuze Guattari ask if the people will be trained, controlled, or annihilated by these powers, or if there is a possibility that there will be openings to the cosmos. Can the earth become cosmic? And can the people of the earth also become cosmic people? To the extent that this is possible, it is what takes the place of the old concept of freedom. Within the refrain, there will always be two milieus, and for Deleuze Guattari, their destiny is the destiny of the earth and its people. One, the territorial, related to the earth, bringing into play folk songs, popular songs, songs of hunters or workers, affective songs of nations. Two, the molecularized, refrains of the sea and the wind, connected to the cosmic. If we hope to make the people of the earth into cosmic people, we will need the refrain, especially the musical refrain. Sound does not communicate or signify or enlighten. More than painting or science or philosophy, sound has the strongest power of deterritorialization. Bach, St. Matthew Passion, Piazzolo, Piazzolas, Esquello, Reich's music for 18 musicians, Munir Bashir's Taksim An Makam, Lami, and reterritorialization, national anthems, and any other signature tune. But as with all pragmatic structures, the refrain needs first a territorial assemblage refrain to work with to transform it into the cosmic refrain. And so, what a philosophy. The very rules of evil, of negativity and singularity, including the ultimate form of singularity, which is This is the typical violence of information. It's violent because what happens there is the murder of the queen, the vanishing point of reality. Let's not have a misunderstanding here. Welcome to Machinic Unconscious Happy Hour with Cooper Cherry and Taylor Atkins, as always, sponsored by the People's Institute for Revolutionary Semiotics. Before we introduce today's discussion and guest, we'd like to mention we have a Patreon account at patreon.com forward slash M-U-H-H. Consider throwing us a dollar a month or maybe, if not, leave us a nice review on iTunes. But today's guest, we're very excited to bring you all, is Dorothea Olkowski professor in the Department of Philosophy at the University of Colorado, currently the Director of Humanities and Director of the Cognitive Studies Minor. She's author of Gilles Deleuze and the Ruin of Representation, The Universal in the Realm of the Sensible, Postmodern Philosophy and the Scientific Turn, and most recently this year, Deleuze, Bergson, and Merleau-Ponty, The Logic and Pragmatics of Creation, Effective Life, and Perception. Dorothea, we are so excited to have you here today. And it's so it's so perfect, the timing, too, because as we were kind of discussing earlier, we've been discussing a lot of Leibniz and calculus and so forth. So it'll be <laughs> nice to d- delve into some of the other aspects that I've particularly been clamoring for for quite a bit, which I think would be time and some of the cinema books. But anyways, sorry for the extended preamble. We're just very excited to have you. Thank you. I'm, I'm really happy to be here and I appreciate the invitation and the opportunity to talk about these things, especially with people who care so much. We do. And, and as you know, I may have mentioned this to you that, that I've been slowly trying to get Cooper more and more into Deleuze. And, and I think <laughs> each, 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 time, each time we have a guest on and we get to read something new in a new perspective. And we've also been doing a kind of a, a walkthrough of anti-Oedipus kind of section by section. And so I think more and more, I thought by this point, Cooper might be burnt <laughs> out on Deleuze, but I think more and more it's crystallizing. And oh, no. But it's also, I mean, how can you master any thinker's corpus, including, you know, Deleuze, sometimes you have to reread 
the same book over and over. And then you come back and you see new things. So just seeing new perspectives like that, it that's one of the reasons why this is so valuable for us and why we're so happy to have you here. I do want to know about your how and why maybe did you get into philosophy? Is there some serendipity, some some anecdote you, you want to sort of let us know about? Just give us a little bit of your sort of personal story, if you feel like. I think I took my first philosophy course maybe in my second semester of college, mm-hmm. and I immediately switched my major from history to philosophy. Wonderful. It took about two <laughs> seconds. <laughs> And that's kind of boring in a way, although, you know, I did do other things. I took a lot of courses in literature Mm -hmm. for a while. I was doing music as well. So there were, you know, there were other things that I was interested in bringing to this in part because I think it always gave me an interdisciplinary approach, which I still have. You know, much later when I went to graduate school, I started reading I can't remember exactly when I started reading Freud and psychoanalysis and that kind of literature. Mm-hmm. It would not have been till graduate school, but my training has always been through the history of philosophy. Yeah. Uh, both as an undergraduate and as a graduate student. And so to a certain extent, Deleuze is perfect for me in that yeah. sense because yeah. He's a historian of philosophy as much as he is a philosopher. And when I first started teaching at UCCS, where I am, the first two years, I taught the ancient Greek philosophy courses. Nice. (laughs) I had the most training of anybody in the department at the time in that area from my graduate work. Right. And I read some ancient Greek. And um, eventually we hired an ancient Greek philosopher, but I did that for quite a while. Um, And I still teach a lot of the history of philosophy in addition to other things, Mm -hmm. such as cognitive studies, particularly cognition and emotion Mm -hmm. is my interest. And also I have a philosophy of language course I love and which has really helped me with Deleuze. It has opened incredible doors for me. In fact, to some extent, maybe responsible for this last book, the way it turned, the way it was oriented. Interesting. Also, a couple of sort of interdisciplinary courses, one on cosmology and one on cyborgs. Oh, okay. Okay. (laughs) So it's out there. I don't like to think of myself as being dispersed, but definitely interdisciplinary. So... Infinite variation, right? (laughs) Yeah, definitely. My, you know, graduate school training, I suppose I came out of that, in addition to history of philosophy, strongly phenomenological, my Mm -hmm. first published paper, which is still in some ways, maybe the best thing I've ever written, because it took me two years. (laughs) I was on Meloponti, from Mm -hmm. the body of consciousness to the body of flesh, and it still gets read, which I'm glad. Which Um, is always nice. (laughs) Yeah, well, I'm glad because I think, you know, it's a solid piece of work. But then, you know, It took me a while before I was able to start the first book, partially because I had a small child and partially because I didn't get, I moved from Charleston, South Carolina to Colorado, and I didn't get my first sabbatical until almost 10 years in. I see. So it took a while to get started. And Gilles Deleuze and the Ruin of Representation is to a certain extent accumulation of all the things I was interested in in that 10-year period. In that 10 years, not to cut you off, because I do want to hear about the sequels or the the continuation of that saga, but I could tell not just when I was first reading your first published book on the ruin of representation, but I could see in the other works, you refer back to it because I think that that not just as a way of sort of promoting your other work, but in a certain way, that 10 year period, that incubation of all these thoughts, I can see that you are also planning these different lines of flight that you get to take up again in other books and sort of instead of you know rewriting the same lines you can orient the reader back in case they they want to catch up or to see how there is that continuity i would say that the ruin of representation which is read a lot by people in the arts which i'm very glad because it talks extensively about the work of mary kelly it's used by people in a variety of arts based on what i see on academia Mm -hmm. you the website and you know other places it's really a bergsonian deleuze and throughout the book i refer to deleuze bergson so it's a deleuzean bergson and a bergsonian deleuze (laughs) and that is something that you know it worked really well 
for dealing with the whole question of the arts, but also there's a chapter on Lacan, mm -hmm. <laughs> and there's work on Freud in addition to Bergson. So, you know, it covers quite a bit of ground, I have to say, but, you know, that's 10 years worth of ground that went into that book. So, and I still think that for anyone who's coming to Deleuze from Bergson, especially that, you know, the sections on Bergson are, are really helpful to show how Deleuze uses Bergson. I don't separate them in that book, but I do that later. Other work, but also for anyone in the arts, I think it seems to have proven to be a strong source of interest and they're able to use it in their work, which is basically what I want. I want it to be useful. Yes, of course. Um, I would say that the book that did start my Deleuze publication is the one I did with Konstantin Bundas, the co-edited book, which he invited me to join him, something for which I'm very grateful. At the time, it was the first edited collection yep. in English. <laughs> um, I think there have been many since then. Some of them are ones I've added. But before that, when I was in graduate school, my interest in Deleuze came First of all, I read the Nietzsche book for yep. a course. I don't remember being in love with it, but I did use it. I wrote <laughs> at least one article on it. I'm not really very Nietzschean in, in my thinking. That's um, okay. Not there, what there's, I do. There's, there's, there's a whole <laughs> series of Deleuze's. There's Deleuze Guattari, Deleuze yeah. Spinoza, Deleuze Bergson, Deleuze Nietzsche. Yeah. The book that really grabbed me, I went into the bookstore at the University of Pittsburgh and I found, because they have a psychology graduate program there, PhD. And I found his book on masochism. Yeah. Just like threw me for a loop. It just grabbed me. I was like, that was it. I was hooked. Okay. So it's now a great book. It's a great book. <laughs> it is interesting too, because as you know, Lacan, I, I know Cooper and I, we've discussed this too, but as you know, Lacan kind of singles that book out as being worthy of praise. And it's for someone who's not his student. I assume Deleuze was attending some lectures, but he was, it's kind of interesting to see Lacan bringing in some of these philosophers, obviously like, um, like one of Deleuze's teachers, you know, he believes and he's, he's praising Deleuze for this, this book on, that's not by an analyst. So it's, it's kind of interesting to see that, that it was well received at the time. And, and then, you know, working on the theater of philosophy with Bundes really introduced me to an international cast of people who were reading and writing about Deleuze. Interestingly, after that book came out, Bundes was expressed to me one day, Kostas expressed to me one day that, oh, you know, I haven't heard from, from Deleuze. I hope that, I hope he liked the book. He sent yeah. it to him, of course. And I wrote, so I wrote to Deleuze, like, yeah. oh, God, you know? <laughs> and I said, well, what do you think? <laughs> and, you know, he said, it's great that, in America, he wrote back, which was very kind, a yeah. very scrawly, scriggly, hard to read note. <laughs> <laughs> but he said, uh, it's great that, you know, the Americans are interested in this work. But he also said, actually, I think he said, Etats Unis, US. And, uh, but he said, I want you to pursue your own work. And yeah. so that's what I tried to do. It sounds like what he would say. He, he's, he's said it in other <laughs> forums, you know, with a similar types of things, especially like with the letters of a harsh critic, he's kind of mocking the whole idea of a book about him and on him and just kind of like, don't do that. Honestly, I've tried not to write a book about him. And yes. Probably to my detriment, I've succeeded. For better or worse. Yes. For and, better or worse. And so the the next book in the installment is uh, is The Universal, which is something that I read through briefly before focusing on your latest work. Do you want to tell us about that that follow-up and what is it, 2007? Yeah. I wrote The Universal at a time when I was deeply involved in reading and understanding physics. And that happened because I learned that Deleuze's, the structure of difference and repetition, the structure that dominates that book is the structure of differential equations mm -hmm. and deterministic chaos. And once I realized that there was this mathematical structure underlying his work, and that structure is there for a long time, he never quite gives it up, although he 
I would say he never stops looking for other ways to formulate and structure his ideas. It became clear to me that I needed to understand at least the theory of these mathematical structures and the physics that accompanies them. And I remember coming out of my study one day really upset when I realized that deterministic chaos was a deterministic system and that the differential, the system of differential equations that Deleuze was using was a deterministic system. And it seemed to me to be a problem. And so the universal is a criticism yes. of that structure, which probably didn't go over very well with a lot of Deleuzeans, that it's a criticism of that particular structure and of its limitations, and a proposal for a different structure, which is based on quantum physics, particularly the work of a Greek physicist, Fotini Markopolo, and her often what do you say, not her mentor, but the person she worked with for years, uh, Lee Smolin. And uh, so the book cover is one that I designed. Really? Based on Fotini Markopolo's model of time. Interesting. Based on intuitionistic logic and algebra, which unlike most other logics and algebras, allows for time temporality. Mm -hmm. So what she does and I do is privileged time over space. One of the issues of the book is that I wrote it almost like literature. And I don't think that's necessarily a problem, but that's <laughs> but I, I see that as, as a plus because I do too. It's because, hard to read. So I find I need some literature to kind of it's uh, very <laughs> literary. It's I, intensely literary. Coop, you remember I texted you the other night saying that I really, because I was reading the Universal, just, I didn't get all the way through, but I read uh, the first two chapters and I was saying how you had this, you had this poetic sensibility and to, to match with the philosophy. And so it is interesting to think about the later work that perhaps, even the most recent work that seems to reiterate some of these these claims, but in a way that perhaps is more, I don't want to say consumable, but more uh, digestible for... Yeah, you know, you're right. It's, it's more traditionally philosophical. There's no yes. question about it. However, I have no regrets about Good. the universal. Edinburgh might be because they both <laughs> did. <laughs> but, <laughs> but because of that, the next book, Postmodern Philosophy and the Scientific Turn, because I knew I was going to talk to you guys this week. I, I don't go back to my old work, but I did, you know, and I went back and read the introductions and him through parts of the books. And I realized that that book is an explanation of the universal. That book is a traditional philosophical explanation of what I'm doing in the universal. I don't love it as much. I don't dislike it. It doesn't have the literary sensibility. Yeah. It's certainly much easier to read. Or a philosopher, you know, for people looking for a philosophical text. And I think that it's good to have both, right? It's good to have the the literary version, perhaps the sexier version, if you will, the more enjoyable version, the one that it provokes thought in a different way. It causes one to almost get immersed in the text rather than constantly reflecting on the concepts or the ideas or, or whatnot. I guess, you know... I wanted at least one opportunity to write something in a way that I really wanted to do philosophy. Excellent. It was unacceptable. <laughs> I think what would, would help, say, a more traditionally philosophical reader, who I think should also be immersed in the arts and literature, et cetera, but I'm not judging, would be the fact that in the universal, and this would be the last thing I say about it for now, is you do a lot of the heavy lifting in the footnotes. So if you're not if you're not reading those footnotes, yeah. then then I can see how one might be lost in what's going on. But if you are able to, or like me, who I, I kind of have a footnote fetish, I've called it before. <laughs> I I really do enjoy yeah. footnotes. So when you're when you're able to pause and or at least read a paragraph and then look at the look the footnotes to keep along, you you get a different text. It's almost a second book in the footnotes. It is the. Yeah. the I mean, all of the literary articulations are, thank you for pointing that out, because I really didn't think of it that way. But 
now that you say it, I, I recall that I wanted each and every literary aspect of it or each and every literary flourish or poetical flourish. I wanted to show that it had a very clear scientific and or philosophical explanation and that those are in the footnotes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, even when you're when you're looking at literature, you're framing it in in this this broader philosophical quantum physical you know, am, point yeah. of view. But you just have to look at the footnotes to see that. Otherwise, I could see how a it casual reader might just it might be white noise that wards them off. But I think that that's that's just a uh, sometimes we we have our own horizons of prejudice and we have to you know, deal with that. And so I enjoyed it very much. And I just think it just, you know, uh, it's different strokes for, for different folks. But I, I see how postmodern philosophy, the scientific turn, and I thought it was really interesting the way that you juxtapose that to what's what we usually call the linguistic turn in right. philosophy. And I love this notion that we need a clear and concise sort of not description but a, an explanation for what what would be postmodernism and whether or not it satisfies Richard Dawkins or whatever it doesn't matter right we should <laughs> we should deal with that issue yes <laughs> i i have sympathy for that view i i would say that being able to write rewrite the universal in postmodern philosophy and the scientific turn being able to rewrite it came to a large extent out of teaching philosophy of language it just blew my mind when I realized how much of the material I was dealing with was closely tied to formalist philosophy of language, therefore to logic and logical structures. And that is something that persists into the most recent book as well. Mm -hmm. There's a chapter on that based yep. on what Deleuze and Guattari themselves have done. One of the things about postmodernism is that it's, you know, when you read, when you read about it online, and I'm actually completing an essay on postmodernism. Oh, great! For Stanford University Encyclopedia, awesome. which I'm praying they will actually accept. One never knows. Yes, <laughs> I've got my fingers crossed. We'll see. But um, you know, don't count my ducks until they hatch. Yes, exactly. But, but I can say I've been working on it for about two years. Oh, uh, so um, the thing. I came to realize is that postmodernism is normally dismissed as yes. you know uh, anything goes or flaky or you know relativism relativistic <laughs> no real ex and the irony of it is is absolutely not it's based on it's the equivalent right of this formalist turn to logic and language yeah the analytic philosophy and we just don't see it because one of the things that bothers me is that continental philosophers have stopped paying attention to science and math and by extension logic, although for me, mathematics is more interesting. Yes. <laughs> but logic can be too. I'm aware of that. I don't want to. And um, when I had a, um, I had a fellowship at Western University in Canada for a sabbatical and among the students, like my best friend there among the grad students was a formalist mathematician. I love talking to that guy. He was so smart and I learned so much from him. <laughs> I think you mentioned him in, in your acknowledgements, right? Yeah. You, yeah. He, I mean, so great. Such a great, such a great experience, you know. To go from sort of, sort of, if you will, buffing yourself in, in chaos theory and, and differential equations to then go to formal logic, you really, really did do some some hard hitting and, and philosophy of language, you really went to the, in a certain way, if you, I know this is cliche, but you, you were bridging this analytic continental divide, which I, I think to do that my whole life. Yeah. <laughs> you know, one yeah. of the edited collections that I, I did with that I did with, sorry, blanking on, on the name of it. But anyway, one of my edited Meloponti collections is about that precisely. Yes. With Larry Haas, bridging with Larry Haas, of course, who's a great Meloponti scholar, with bridging that divide. He yes. was something we were both interested in. And you see that carry over into your latest book on Deleuze, Bergson, and Merleau-Ponty, especially in the, the second chapter, as you mentioned, where you go through Deleuze and Guattari's, their kind of critique of sort of formal logic, Frege, et cetera, and how that doesn't yes. really get us to 
philosophical concepts. It, it kind of leaves us with an empty shell, if you will. Yeah, I think their criticism of formalist logic is so good. <laughs> and the thing, one of the reasons it's so good is it's so succinct. You know, and I'm sorry for people who like Baju, but they dismiss Baju in about two seconds. It's almost a bit much, you know, it's kind of shocking. And I must say that one of the reviewers for the manuscript of the book is uh, someone who I know he was a reviewer because I put his name at the top of the list. Uh huh. <laughs> Someone who writes about Badiou, Heidegger, but he comes from analytic philosophy, strong mm. background in Frege, criticized my first take on Frege heavily, so I changed it. I wanted something that an analytic, because my first take on Frege was from a continental perspective. Yeah. I wanted something that an analytic philosopher could swallow without you know, going whole hog into that school. Without getting defensive or re or resisting or or merely dismissive, right? I mean, I think that maybe that pushback was was helpful then. I, I was, I mean, that's why I wanted this person to be one of the reviewers smart. in yeah. manuscript because I knew that if anybody could set me straight, <laughs> and believe me, yeah. he did in no uncertain terms, <laughs> firmly but politely, it made me say, okay, I need. I need to clean this up. I, I want different secondary sources. And I think in the end, the path I took with it was, was correct. Mm -hmm. I've always loved Frege. That's this bizarre thing. You know, I think it's just really cool stuff. But most of the analytic philosophy of language and logic, it's not my training. Yeah. So I'm learning it, you know, by the seat of my pants, let's be honest, you know. I really appreciated the way you, you put forward the argument in that chapter specifically, uh, because I do think it's good to go back and be able to, I know, I think with some other, you know, guests we've had on, we have discussed a little bit of the analytic sort of uh, school in terms of language with respect to a text like Logic of Sense. I feel like it does help a lot to get at least the basics of you know, whether it be Russell, which you also discuss, whether it be you know, Frege, Meinong, you know, these these thinkers who are who are dealing with language in a in a certain way that that really does help to to kind of get oriented in in Deleuze's text, specifically is, logic of sense. It is my argument that the post-structuralist philosophers of the continental school, Derrida, Deleuze. Leotard, whose, Leotard. Work, whose work I adore. Yes, you know. same. We're, we're <laughs> fans. Oh yeah. yeah. Yeah, they were to a very large extent responding to analytic philosophy of language. Yes, that's what they were concerned with addressing, and that is what they were, to me, very clearly addressing. Mm -hmm. And to leave that out is to miss the point. Yes, but postmodern philosophy and the scientific turn that we call the linguistic turn, but you need to understand where it comes from. Yeah, it's not all just Saussure. They're also in dialogue. I mean, in a certain way, for the, the French thinkers of that time, you know, especially the ones who came under Hippolyte, as you kind of mentioned, and, and came yes, to him, yes. right, with, Le you Again. mentioned Leotard, Derrida, yes. Deleuze, they're yes. all, in a certain sense, I would imagine that not only German philosophy, but American it, British philosophy would kind of be, in a certain sense, exotic, like French philosophy might be for for us, uh, you know, Americans. I'm not sure, but that's it. Would be something to, to grapple with, and would be have to be kind of dealt with in a different temporality, maybe, you know, in translation. Well, and for no other reason than for the reason that, you know, Europeans are much better educated in mathematics and science. There you go. Yeah. Americans than yeah. U.S. Americans, Canadians, different. Right? U.S. Americans, South South Americans, different story. Mm -hmm. But U.S. Americans, our, our math and science education is pitiful. You know, unless my classmates, when I was in school, high school, their fathers worked for IBM. They were engineers, and they could go home and ask their dads to please explain this trigonometry to me because my teacher doesn't know what he's doing, you know? But for those of us who did not have that option of going home and asking dad to help to explain it to us, we had to do it on our own. It's funny you say that. My father worked for IBM. He was uh, he taught computer science and mathematics. And so I would sometimes ask him 
not about schoolwork because as you already said, the schoolwork was already a little, it was more or less, you know, straightforward, not difficult, but I would ask him about, you know, Badu and things like this. And I remember one thing he said, I may have said this on the pod before Coop, but I'll repeat it. I remember giving him the rundown of what goes into being an event and him, he just lost patience after about 30 seconds and was like, son, <laughs> he's yeah. like, he's like, son, nobody gives a shit about set theory in math in mathematics. Like, he's like, that's, that's old news, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, but I didn't even get to the philosophical niceties. He just, when I kind of gave him what, what sort of a philosopher and obviously, but a mathematician, but when I kind of told him what he was doing with set theory, my dad was just like, no, nah, I don't want to hear this. <laughs> well, I was lucky that when I was writing the, the universal and mm-hmm. I had access to a really good science library from a colleague. You know, Scientific American, for example, has published many, many, many volumes, and they are so good. Mm-hmm. And many other, many other sources. And I found this to be extremely useful for what yeah. I was doing. You started to ask about the three body problem, and I, I, I wanted to get yeah, that in another direction. To a certain extent, I mean, this is something that crops up all the time when you start teaching or doing physics or or reading about physics. But at that point, because, you know, a lot of times in my books, I talk about some literature that I've been reading Mm -hmm. that works. And I was reading Xi Jin Lu's three-volume, three-body problem, science fiction. Gotcha. Okay. And um, it made it extremely evident. The first volume of that is about a planet whose people are fleeing because they have two sons. And every time the third, the second son shows up, destroys, more or less destroys the planet and they have to start over. So they're, they're leaving and trying to come to earth. So it's a question of how, when you have three entities of any kind, can you bring them into alignment with one another and make sense? And mathematically it's been solved, quote unquote, dealt with might be a better by privileging one of those bodies. And of course, in this book, Deleuze is the one who is privileged, obviously foregrounded. I want what I'm interested in is the relationship between Deleuze and Bergson, Deleuze and Meloponti, but also I have to address that secondary relationship between Bergson and Meloponti because yes. of the figure in. In general, this book is something that, you know, often people write a book like this with such explicit names. <laughs> the first book. I could never have managed that. I feel like I needed a lifetime of working on these philosophers to understand them yeah. independently and then their relationship to one another. Mm-hmm. And then even then, I mean, took a couple of years to write that. Took at least two years. It is interesting to think of a book on, say, multiple authors as a body problem. And I thought that that was a fascinating way to, I guess, visualize it. But again, transpose into into scientific terms this sort of as a thought experiment or as the way of sort of categorically stating up front what is at stake in the book. And I like that you also you don't forget to mention that your three body problem is kind of a four body problem because Guattari is is sort of in the mix there, kind of interweaving himself in the in the interstices. Well, that has a lot to do with how I understand Deleuze's thought to move from his early work through DNR and Logique de Sens and Mille Plateau. Um, all the way to what is philosophy. Mm -hmm. So that figures in because as he himself said that my loose reading of it is Guattari shook him up. (laughs) Yeah. And that has to do with the mathematical structure that I foreground as being the structure of Deleuze's work. There's a certain sense in which he was so invigorated by yeah. this mathematical structure of the differential equation, even though, by the way, there's always this underlying thing with Charles Peirce. We can talk about that a little later. Yeah, yeah. That is very strong, even in difference of repetition mm-hmm. already, and in other surprising places already. So, you know, but, you know, you get this feeling like, whoa, you know, here's this incredible structure that he's found that, and he just starts 
applying it. But unlike for me, anyway, someone like Derrida, who just never gives up deconstruction, mm-hmm. Deleuze meets Guattari, and already you can see things changing in Logique de Sens already. You know, there's a lot more going on there. That's a really different book. It stands out almost as a tangent. Yeah. In a very good way. So, you know, that opened a lot of doors for him and took him in, opened up different directions. And then anti Oedipus, right? Which is essentially, in my reading, mm-hmm. and some people don't like this. I'm sorry. <laughs> There's this paper out there on capitalism that I've written and published, which addresses this problem, this question of, right, this model of the of determinism and the differential equation is the model of capitalism. Yes. And when that becomes extremely apparent in anti-Oedipus, yes. that it is the model of capital, then the question is, what do we do, right? How do we deal with this crisis? And I love Anti-Oedipus. I think it's a brilliant book. I love every page of it. I love the analysis using Marx's Grundrisse. I love that. Um, And that's why I wanted to write about it in that paper as much as I could. And it gave me a chance to dig into that book and read it in more depth. I don't only ever just skimmed it before that. gave me really a chance to read that book of Marx's and really see what, what that was about and realize, you know, how Deleuze and Guattari were using that structure the, of the of the way Marx sets up the development of history. Right. And how it was incorporated into Deleuze's mathematical structure. Mm. And you know, methodologically, it's obvious I'm a I'm a post-structuralist methodologically. Yeah. It's not a philosophical position, it's a methodology. Interesting. We'd yes. like to be very clear about that. And I want to make a d- difference I think too often the minute you embrace a methodology, right, then you're called that. It's an ism. I don't see it as an ism. I see it as a method. And I think it's the same for Deleuze and Deleuze Guattari. To a certain extent, the Deleuzean methodology of DNR unravels under the strain of this Marxist critique, the critique of their own critique of Freud. And I have a paper that just came out in a volume on the family on uh, the end of Oedipus, it's called. And that addresses that problem, that question, how they deal with it in anti-Oedipus. Again, I just think it's a glorious book because it opens doors, just like Logique de Sens, it opens doors. It, You know, when I wrote The Universal, I was doing a critique of difference of repetition and that mathematical structure. Honestly, I could open other books of his and still find it within a few pages. Oh, yeah. It doesn't go away. But it does say to me, anti Oedipus does say to me that, okay, I need to do something more. <laughs> yeah. I being Deleuze, excuse me, I have no right to <laughs> speak with his voice, but there's a need there clearly to be critical of, of one's own work. And this is very explicit later on in his work. He's quite explicit about his reliance on the differential equation, even though, and I, I have that quote in the Deleuze bear some Mel Ponty book, I included it because mm-hmm. I wanted to say that, you know, that was an important recognition on his part. So, yeah. you know, then you have all this experimentation in Mille Plateau. Right? Yes, yes. And from a certain point of view, every plateau could be viewed as a different structure. And so let's, you know, let's play with it. Let's put those different structures forward and see where they take us see which ones work and how they work. Some of them are more successful than others. Some of them have limitations. I've written about nomadology, serious fun. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Which works up to a point and then stops working, as many people have pointed out, you know. It works up to a point, but it doesn't. You're still on a game board. As an aside, just sort of responding, do you think then as we've kind of shown with your cold open is is of the refrain than one of those that kind of attracted you not only as a musician and interest in, in music but is there something <clears throat> is there something about that plateau specifically with their you know description of territory of cosmos of of basically dealing with the chaos 
and we can see this come back in what is philosophy, but is there something about that plateau of the refrain that grabs you? Open system thermodynamics, simply put, it's an open system, new matter and energy. I know that that was something too. I think that you could see a part of just as an aside, again, as a part of Guattari's influence, because I know that's something that he in his solo writings too kind of never gives up on is this notion of the refrain. And But he doesn't claim sole inheritance of it or, or sole proprietorship. He kind of says that they, Deleuze himself says it, but Guattari too, that this is one of the concepts that they're most proud of and that, and that they feel like they actually have an example of creating a concept with refrain more than things like Body Without Organs or deterritorialization even even though Deleuze does say that's a concept but I think that they're most proud of refrain what do you think about that absolutely you know there was a point where I thought I don't know if I can keep doing Deleuze using Mm. his work because of the limitations of the dynamical systems theory from which I can plug into every single book Mm -hmm. easily Mm -hmm. right Mm -hmm. up to the end it's still there so there was a point where I thought, you know, and people are asking me to write papers on Deleuze and blah, 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 you know. And I'll tell you what happened. One of the things that I have really committed myself to doing is to co-editing collections with people who otherwise might have trouble getting published. Interesting. And one of those is Deleuze at the end of the world. All the scholars, with my exception, are from Argentina. I think there's a Brazilian in there as well. They wrote and translated most. I had two of the papers translated, but they translated most of the others because these people are brilliant and they're original. This is so cool what they did is they assigned each of them a figure or a concept, into a persona or a concept into the yeah. that no one else had picked up and talked about. Hmm. And each chapter of that collection addresses one of these unknown knowns (laughs) in a very thorough and comprehensive. And, you know, I mean, these people are incredibly well-educated and smart. And so the year before that, I had co-taught a course with a colleague of mine called Visions of Darkness, and he focused on, on the apocalypse yeah, because you bring up you bring up D. H. Lawrence and Deleuze's yeah. translation in that introduction. Yeah. And I wrote a paper for a small conference that we had, which I still haven't published, but I would like to because it's fun. It's a, it's a, like kind of a cool paper, kind of fun thing. And so because Deleuze had written about Lawrence and Lawrence written about had published this thing on the apocalypse, it took me. So I I used that material for the introduction to the Deleuze at the end of the world book. Because the whole idea of apocalypse is the end of the world. So it allowed me to once again pick up, even after the Deleuze Meloponti book, Deleuze Berson Meloponti book, it allowed me to further develop this concept of the refrain and to show how, in a Deleuzean, Deleuze Guattarian context, how this can be an open system and possibly, in my view, more satisfying than any of the other structures that Deleuze comes up with. And system is the wrong word, because I, as I cite in the last book, Deleuze, and this sounds like Deleuze more than, than Guattari, but Deleuze says, I, no, from, uh, it's from uh, Mille Plateau. He says, enough systems. I'm done with systems. And that's one reason why in my early work, I was still talking about ontology, but um, and this is a dispute I had with my Argentine friends because they want to do ontology. And I'm saying, no, by the end, it's pragmatism. It's not ontology. Yeah, It's a completely different thing. And I think that the idea of the refrain, and it's built, it's a physics model, right? The whole, the black hole, the whole notion about acceleration, you know, all of the concepts in there, even though it's based on music and to some extent, sculpture that moves. It's based on movement. Nevertheless, it is a a structure, a method, if you will. It's another method. And it, it, it made me feel better about continuing to advocate 
for Deleuze and to continue to use Deleuze because it comes much closer to the quantum theoretical model of the universal that I proposed, which given how current physics has developed, and again, my scientific training is entirely self-taught with help from experts here and there who will talk to me. Nonetheless, everything I know about contemporary physics is that quantum is where it's at. Nobody understands it. I mean, the whole question is how to gain entry. When I was working on those questions, it seemed to me that Fotini, Marcopolo, and Lee Smolin's approach through time and temporality, because you know physics is always about geometry, right? So there, Fotini, Marcopolo says, I've got news for you, right? Geometry is derivative from time. Yeah, that's that works for me. That resonates for me because that's what Bergson says as well. My own work on affect and sensibility, that's what that tells me as well. So um, I'm looking for empirical verification, which I think we philosophers need. It's not, I don't want pie in the sky and speculation. I want something that can be, at least what a scientist would say is, if you have a theory and you can at least propose an experiment that's doable, maybe we don't have the technology now, but we will, we can, then the theory has you know, it's not useful. It doesn't have value. You have to be able to posit a doable experiment. It has to be able to be tested in some way, shape, or form. Well, philosophical ideas need the same thing, right? We have to see how they work. We have to put them to use and see how they work. I really like that notion because it this is something else that Cooper and I were talking about discussing your work earlier in the week. It reminds me of the fact that, as you said, that it needs some some sort of experimental framework potentially. And this is why I think Cooper pointed out how much he appreciated your usage of, of speculative fiction. Do you want to say something about that, Coop? Just uh, your, your thought on sort of what you enjoy about that? I was talking to Dorothea before you okay. joined us a little bit about how I appreciated that and a little bit about our discussion of how I've kind of brought up dunes as a sort of refrain of my own recently to kind of, I feel like for me, the sort of narrative the narrativization of the theory is where that's where I can really get excited and start to make connections and and understand things. And I've been using Dune, which you said you like the uh, the real sci-fi, and I think that's a good point. That I think <laughs> Dune is definitely more of I think it's a it's a fantasy, more fantasy, more yeah. fantasy for sure. But I think maybe where we can sort of agree or move forward with that is relative to the idea in Dune of prescient visions and. This is something that I felt, I don't know, I had sort of an intuition that maybe this movement image and the time image and these prescient visions that let's say, you know, Paul Mordeeb has about the future and some type of connection and even to maybe even dogmatic images of thought or or something along those lines. So that's something that I've been thinking about relative to not only time, but the cinema books in particular. At one time, I wanted to be a filmmaker as well. There's a long backstory to how I actually ended up starting the podcast in lieu of that. (laughs) I don't know if that's what what you were thinking about specifically, Taylor. Yeah, I guess I was thinking about that as well as, but to piggyback off what you just said about the Prussian visions, it reminds me a little bit of sort of the way you frame the opening of the universal where you're discussing these heterogeneous spatio-temporalizations. And some of this is also in the new book with... um, sort of a, a kind of multiplicity of memory cones or, or these refractions of, of oh, light. Yeah. I think that that may be the way to maybe discuss a little bit of Bergson and, and his influence on, as you said, your deleuze Bergson assemblage has kind of been with you since your first book. So do you want to say maybe in light of this, uh, sort of how Bergson and his influence on Deleuze, whether it be cinema, time? It's enormous. I mean, it's, you know, it's huge, but Two things. First of all, about time and then Deleuze's reading of Bergson. Yes. So the two separate issues. So this, this image in the universal of these light cones, which are a well-known figure from... Matter and memory or... No, from physics. <laughs> oh, sorry. I apologize. <laughs> I was thinking of the cone. My bad. <laughs> They're a well-known figure from physics, but normally you have a single light cone in a concept of time that's called block time. And block time is spatial time. It's spatialized time. And 
all of those times of block time are simultaneous. What Fotini Marcopolo did using intuitionistic logic, which is temporal, you cannot in the present make an absolute claim about the truth or falsity of something that may or may it may or may not turn out to be true in the future. So you have it, you know, which symbolic and much other logic doesn't allow you to do that. What she does is she connects these light cones. And what the light cones allow is the passage of information. So the idea that we are, which many physicists have expressed, not mm -hmm. that's not my idea, that we are formed out of the clouds, out of the stars, the very yeah. material of the stars. And I, if I listen to lectures by cosmologists on YouTube, they often, they like to you know, refer to that. And I think it's good that they do because it gives people a very different idea. I mean, we are literally formed out of the same material as the stars. Mm -hmm. And these light cones are connected. Not all the information goes to every light cone because speed of light, only some information, right? Some information will fall outside of those light cones. Right. But this led to the concept that I developed of everyone a crowd. Interesting. Rather than abstract individualism, mm -hmm. crowd phenomena. And so to me, you know, Bergson's use of the light cone from physics is absolutely brilliant <laughs> because he changes it. He doesn't use it the way it was used by relative by um special relativity, by Einsteinian physics in Einsteinian yeah. physics. Okay. He doesn't use it in the same way. He doesn't put it in a block universe where all times are spatially simultaneous, spatial and therefore simultaneous. He connects it to intuition. Mm -hmm. So this goes back to Cooper. That's the element that intuition has been seriously degraded, downgraded, you know, eliminated. It's mm -hmm. something I write about in these books that intuition yes. has been hit hard. I mean, you can go back to Descartes' intellectual intuition. What's wrong with that, you know? And then Michelle Ledoux writes extensively about the history of intuition and philosophy and the use of intuition and philosophy. And, and then you can pick that up in Bergson, right? Intuition as time, as temporalization, as duration, as, as ontologically prior to extension, to space. Yeah. There's a multitude of possible ways of connecting this and making use of this so to me, that's one really important link, because keep in mind that with Deleuze, we have the three temporal syntheses, which are very complex and very difficult. But to me, it's easier to make sense of them when you situate them in relationship to Charles Peirce, firstness, secondness, and thirdness, which Deleuze, to me, clearly does. I hope I showed that adequately. I thought it was brilliant, <laughs> by the way, but keep going. <laughs> Thank you. That came from actually teaching philosophy of language. And when I started teaching Peirce, I was so jazzed and overwhelmed. I couldn't, I couldn't help but start getting completely immersed in it. And I was incredibly grateful. You know, Peirce wrote a lot and his collected works are online. You can read it online. It's a lot of volumes. It's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot. But, but without that, I don't know that I could have written anywhere near as well about the purse Deleuze relationship. And like so much of Deleuze, what really matters to him is hidden. He talks about it in the cinema books, but the real impact of it starts in difference and repetition. And it continues through what is philosophy. And firstness, secondness, and thirdness are commensurate with the three syntheses of time. And um, also with his reinterpretation of Plato, <laughs> yeah. you know? All of this matters, you know, all of this is, it's incredibly useful in a lot of ways. I teaching, actually, I'm teaching phenomenology right now to my undergraduates and, you know, they're concerned about phenomenology's emphasis on unity because they're looking for diversity, of course, you know, and I was able to say, well, you know, both Deleuze, here's some examples, Deleuze and Charles Peirce both have this notion of generalization and of continuity, but for Charles Peirce, he describes it as a multiplicity of, we'll say, points mm -hmm. that is so dense that you cannot distinguish between them. And Deleuze has a very similar structure. He calls it differentiation. I said to them, you know, you can have continuity and differentiation if you 
understand how to structure it. The other thing about about Deleuze and Bergson, I realized when I went to this com to this seminar on cosmic and human space and time, which I was very lucky to be invited to. It was an amazing experience. I don't know that I had, I realized before I got there what it was going to be. I wish I had known more about it. Interesting. Yeah. I would have approached it differently, but water over the dam. Anyway, there was a well-known French philosopher there whose name I will not mention, who after I Gave, I talked about Bergson and intuition and mm. uh, continuity mm-hmm. because they were very clever. The organizers of the conference put me in a, a panel with a cosmologist who argued that time is an illusion. Okay. And my paper was titled Time is Real. So it was very devious, of them, you know. <laughs> and um, this person who has commented extensively on in his work in France on Bergson said to me, oh, well, Bergson didn't really understand Einstein. He was behind the times. He was still a Newtonian. Einstein was still a Newtonian. Sorry. It was kind of an unnecessary comment. Nevertheless, I'm extremely grateful for it because I I sat down and I thought, what the heck? And I turned around. He was sitting behind me in the audience. And I looked at him. I said, you're a formalist, aren't you? And he wouldn't answer. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) That's when I started digging into uh, what happened with Russell and Russell's attempt to just bury Bergson, just just crush him, which seems to me to be very small, but okay. He's probably jealous, too, of how sort of celebrated Bergson was at the time and and how he had crowds of he was causing, you know, uh, traffic jams and at Columbia University. And there's probably a little bit of jealousy there, I would assume. Yes. And. My understanding of what Deleuze did to resuscitate that is he actually provides a Russellian reading. And that's yeah. explained in the book, that he reads it, he makes it compatible with Russell. It's fascinating the way you pointed that out, that there is a kind of buggering of Bergson with his greatest be- enemy. If you want to use Deleuze's kind of okay, metaphor. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> you know, he, he, takes, he takes Bergson's, like, greatest adversary and sort of immunizes. Yeah. From That's a nice way of looking at it. I appreciate (laughs) that. I think it's a great way of looking at it. In so doing, you know, I had been writing about Bergson since graduate school, so I Mm. didn't need that push. But what Deleuze did is he made Bergson acceptable again. Yeah. Yeah. By doing that. Nevertheless, we must acknowledge that it's different from right and therefore i also have to say that the deleuze of the ruin of representation is more bergsonian than deleuze probably is interesting i'm reading deleuze through bergson in that book but i don't need to provide a deleuzean deleuze account of deleuze blah 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 i just need to do philosophy so it's fine as long as I'm doing philosophy and it adds up and the arguments are coherent and evidentiary. <laughs> and enlightening. I thought it was interesting, just to stick with this before letting you continue, I, I thought it was interesting that I didn't realize Bergsonism was this was this kind of epithet or this this kind of put down from the time of Russell and whatnot, yeah. that, that Bergsonism was yeah. this kind of insult. And so for Deleuze to use name, it. to name his book that, it does seem to be this tongue-in-cheek, well, it, it obviously is. Oh, it's, he, it's this, he puts it in their face. I love it. Yeah, yeah. It's not even tongue-in-cheek. It's, it's, it's right out there. And to yeah. use the insult as a way to, you know, resuscitate Bergson or make him I'm not going to say popular again, but at least make him fall back into favor if, it, if he had fallen out, which it seems like more well, or less. Yeah. But then, yeah. you know, there, there's a book by a physicist, uh, what's his name, Capra, I'm terrible with people's names, about Bergson and physics. It's a great book. I refer to it in my bibliographies and in my notes. And he's a theoretical physicist who says, hey, Bergson probably was pretty much on track with mm. this, 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 and this, even from a physics standpoint. So, you right. know, even a physicist is stepping in to say there's something worth reading here. There's something worth thinking about here. 
Also interesting there is Merleau-Ponty, who had his differences from Bergson, in part because, let's face it, when Merleau-Ponty was coming up, Bergson was the star. Interesting, yeah. And they all had to separate themselves from him. So Merleau-Ponty went in the direction of perception. He, you know, sidestepped the whole Bergsonian thing. But he did step in, as I as I cite in the book. Yes. He said, there seem to be two Bergsons, <laughs> you know. There's the one Russell gives you, and then there's yes. the real one. <laughs> yes. And I hooray for Merleau-Ponty for doing that. <laughs> yeah, I, I thought that was interesting. Two Bergsonisms. There's the there's the bad one, which is probably the one that everyone's familiar with. But then there's this there's this undercurrent, which I think is also kind of what Deliz is saying. Like, hey, there's there is this yeah. other Bergsonism that shouldn't be thought of as an insult, but should but be celebrated. Still, you know, in the cinema books, when he tries to undo Bergson's critique of film as a spatiality artificially reconstructed. I'm sorry. You know, it's like I'm not on board. The way that works is through purse, where you begin with thirdness, continuity, or what Deleuze in the very beginning of difference and repetition calls generalization. Yeah. We begin with the general, the way they understand it, not some abstract logical concept of generalization from Aristotle. That's, I think, why people miss it because. Deleuze is generalization, and he articulates it in a way that is positive. And people just skip over it, I think, because I think they think he's talking about Aristotle. He's not. He's really doing purse. Right. He's yeah. doing purse. And in other words, continuity is its thirdness, but it's also first. It's, and first it's- actually says that thirdness becomes the firstness of second. The, it's the yeah, same as, as <laughs> it, he does something similar with depth, right? Depth seems to be the third dimension, but it actually provides the foundation, the ungrounded ground for the other dimensions, right? So there's something similar with the thirdness going on. And that that was what I thought of when you were kind of eliciting mm-hmm. Purse's influence on difference of repetition, which I hadn't thought of before. I was rethinking his things about the future being, being it may seem to be the third dimension, but it actually undergirds the others. Same with depth, right? So thirdness, as you said, is, is firstness in a certain way. Well, firstness is purely qualitative, of course, in purse. Secondness is brute existence. And thirdness is continuity or generalization. So, you know, that all comes together as well in Deleuze's Three Syntheses of Time. This is great. And, and, and as you said, it's your way to make sense of them also. <laughs> yeah, we could have a whole episode on just the three syntheses or even just one synthesis. So I do think that there was something I wanted to connect back to the universal because it was a refrain in my head over the past few days where you bring out this notion of a vulnerable sensitivity and a vulnerable duration. And I was trying to think it in relation to your newest work, and there's probably a lots of different ways of interpreting it or to explicate it. But one of the things that, that struck me was it takes this force, it takes this violence to force the faculties into their discord and accord in order to sort of, in order for this this being of the sensible to which can't be sensed to pose this problem to and perplex the soul. I was wondering, I was trying to figure out what exactly for you vulnerable in this context meant, as in we have to be vulnerable to the either the creation of the new or to the experience of the new in a sort of affective way. Can you say anything about that? One way to make sense of it is through Bergson's notion of affective sensibility and intuition. Even neurophysiologically and biologically, yes, we have our five senses, but we have many affective sensors, C-fibers and others, that are below the level of these large receptors that we pay the most attention to vis-a-vis perception. And by means of those, right, in a Bergsonian schema, this is what constitutes ontological, the ontological unconscious, which is purely imagistic. It's not yet representational. Images, as I try to say, on all levels, all kinds of affective images, some of which we can understand as visual, sensor, you know, haptic, oral, whatever that is. <laughs> Ol- olfactory. Ol- olfactory. Yeah. Thank you. I lost sense of my senses. <laughs> but 
much of which is occurring all the time on uh, neurophysiological levels that we are unaware of. Yes. It's something I like to bring to my students all the time and say, you know, even on a crude level, you know, you're completely unaware of the feel of the seat that you're sitting on until I point it out to you, or the feel of your foot on the floor, or the ambiance of the room. I don't mean pleasant, unpleasant, the lighting, sounds, what sounds are there, and simply how it's making you feel creepiness or comfort. Or, you know, we don't really have a language for all of those lesser sensibilities, affectivities. That's what vulnerable sensibility is trying to get to. I can attribute it perhaps a little bit to the refrain when Deleuze and Guattari talk about the little boy. Yeah, whistling past the graveyard or something yeah, like this. Yeah, but, and the danger of falling into the black hole, right? Yeah. And you know, it irritates me if people are celebrating that the black hole or the schizo state. My son actually is a mental health counselor. His clients are schizophrenics. Okay. And I have spoken to him quite a bit about this when we have time to talk about it together. And also there's a wonderful Greek woman named Chloe who worked at the Lacanian psychiatric unit in southern France where Guattari was and you know worked on all of these experimental levels with schizophrenics and so you know this is stuff that you can't just say oh you know we're free it's great you know because that's not how it works and it's why in the past I used to write about Antonin Artaud because the man suffered a lot. He suffered tremendously. And my son's patients suffered tremendously. As my son said, you know, it's because the chemicals in their brain are wrong. It's not their fault. They have done nothing. And it's incredibly frustrating for them to have to experience this and to be told, well, it's because the chemicals in your brain are doing this to you, the balance of a brain neurophysiology. And we're just trying to, you know, help you do something with it. I take this stuff really seriously. I want real solutions. And I realized, by the way, that looking through postmodern philosophy, it's a book of ethics, which is like, I'm not an ethicist, but that's <laughs> a book of ethics. And it's an ethics about this stuff. And the last chapter is about Arendt and Beauvoir to a very large extent, using their ideas to, you know, to find a method for this ethics. And I mean, the whole book is oriented towards an ethical methodology and trying to create an ethical methodology that I'm more clear about in the last chapter of that book. I'm not saying it's simple. <laughs> right, right. But I feel like we, just like, you know, the passage you had me read at the beginning, we need to ask, you know, what is philosophy and what are we doing when we make these kinds of ethical proclamations? And how do we create a better methodology for both? What do we make of philosophy and what can philosophy make of Deleuze and Guattari's kind of call for this release of, of a refrain out into the cosmos? I was thinking back to your closing pages when you were mentioning the offsided, you know, we're all stardust. Thing, but there, but I think that that's part of it, right? The sort of cosmic aspect, which you point out in all three of the thinkers in Bergson, in Deleuze, in Merleau-Ponty, this this sort of broader vision that, yeah. while it's both promoting deterritorialization, but as you said, there is this sense in which, especially maybe more in a thousand plateaus than anti Oedipus, they also urge a kind of caution, right? Of, yes. of don't, yes. don't deterritorialize too quickly. The, yeah. the threat of the black hole, mm -hmm. the threat of, of the collapse of sort of all strata can obviously lead to this suicidal line of flight. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's very true. And so I think that all of that is makes a lot of sense. And or the, the whole idea that, you know, we embrace our own fascism, which mm -hmm. we see a lot of in current culture. When you were saying your, your third book, um, 
you know, postmodern philosophy as a book of ethics, I'm thinking of kind of Foucault's preface to Anti-Oedipus, which he, he says it's like the first book of ethics to be written in France for a very long time. And so, you know, to bring in your sort of the work your son was doing and relating it to, to what Guattari was doing at Labor, I do think that one of the things they regret about Anti-Oedipus is the fact that so many people came away, a casual reading of the book, you come away from where they're celebrating the schizo life. And so they kind of regret perhaps not being even though they say it more than once, they regret it becoming this bad refrain, this kind of noise of celebrating schizophrenia, which even yeah. leads the Liz to say, Viva la paranoia, right? Like, yeah, um, you know, yeah. like, go back, go back, go back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And grab some paranoia before it's too late. <laughs> One other brief thing I would like to say. Yes. I also wanted to make a clear distinction between Deleuze and Meloponti. To make it very clear the ways in which, although Deleuze respects Meloponti, he's not doing phenomenology, not by a long shot. And then the project for me, to a certain extent, has been, well, okay, so where, where do I use phenomenology? It's not that hard, you know? There's clearly a place for it. And there's a place for Uridoxa. And there's a place for that kind of project. And it's very interesting to me that in the structure of behavior, Meloponti is talking about quantum physics. Mm -hmm. yeah. he's, mod, he's got a section on physics and it's quantum, it's not classical. And his critique of Einstein is that Einstein is classic, classical, classicist. And so, you know, I want to give credit where credit is due. And I want to say there's, you know, if you're a Deleuzean, it doesn't mean that you have to like stop doing phenomenology. There's a place for it. We need yes. it. As I say to my students, no philosopher has all the answers. Impossible. You look to what they were working on and to the area of philosophy that they constituted, that they involve themselves with. Deleuze's concerns are very different from Meloponti's. He's closer to Bergson's, but still, as I pointed out, Bergson has his own concerns that Deleuze doesn't always embrace that either. And there's a distinction between Peirce and Deleuze, you know. Peirce is still much more within this, he calls it a skeleton, a skeletal framework. Deleuze is much less skeletal. You know, I was thinking when I was reading your juxtaposition and of the three bodies, right, of Deleuze, Merleau-Ponty, and Bergson, how much Deleuze inherits some of Merleau-Ponty from Simon Don, who was a student of Merleau-Ponty and dedicated his dissertation to, to Merleau-Ponty. That was one of the voices that I was filling in in the Merleau-Ponty chapters was how Simon Don, how much he influenced Deleuze. And that's a kind of a secret link, another little secret link between the two of them. I know I, I, I sometimes hog the conversation because I get a little excited. I do want Coop to, to jump in if, if he, if he, uh, Feels like it's a good good place. <laughs> I might just back up and do some more basic questions. Do you have a recommendation if I'm interested in pursuing the study of time? Is there a starting point within Bergson's work or even other thinkers that you would recommend that I sort of look at? I think in Bergson, Matter and Memory is a hard book. I try to start with creative evolution. I think it's much more readable. I teach it to undergraduates. They get it. They like it. And I think that it opens the door to many aspects of Bergson's thought without drowning you. <laughs> you know, Matter and Memory is a brilliant book, but it is quite difficult, complex. I like for people to read Kant, but I suggest that everyone start with the prolegomena. One thing I'm, I've taught the prolegomena for years to undergraduates. It's been very, very useful to do that because it makes you, you know, you have to back down and you can't just like say stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you have to give them a structure and you have to say, this is very clearly the structure in con and this is what we're concerned about. And so I think the prolegomena is a wonderful introduction to Kant. I want to say that Deleuze has been my very best teacher of Kant ever. Yeah. And I feel, maybe I'm wrong, but I feel like I have a reading of Kant that really works and it's strong and I love it. And I love reading Kant this way. There are some places where I'm critical, particularly in the critique of practical reasons. Mm -hmm. yeah. But by and large, I'm a big fan. And 
Deleuze for forcing me to read it yeah. <laughs> in a way that I, I mean, I dug in deeply and I have no regrets. I, you know, it's one of the greatest privileges I've had as a philosopher to do that. You Nevertheless, <laughs> you want to start with the prolegomena. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> it's, it's a great book. And, you know, he wrote it after the critique. And the interesting thing also is that if you read and understand Hume, you will read and understand the prolegomena because he says quite clearly, you know, in the critique, I started sort of with the transcendental. Here I'm starting with the Humean empirical and going in that direction. So if you've read Hume, he's telling us, can get this. You mentioned so, earlier. Oh, sorry. Did I interrupt? You? Okay. That's all right. Thank you. You mentioned a bit about being interested in cosmology. This is also an area that I'm very much interested in. I think you know, the sort of like speculative physics, string theory, M theory. Is this something that you had engaged with in some of the earlier texts or do you have... Um, yeah, it's some, in some, the universal. In the universal? Okay, gotcha. Yeah, it's in the universal. Taylor and I share a um, a Twitter account for the podcast and I had been saying, hey, is there, is there anyone engaging with Deleuze and cosmology, you know, with the view right towards, <laughs> right, with the view towards string theory. And, you know, of course, Taylor here, very tongue in cheek, his reply was, oh, yeah, just read anti Oedip- <laughs> uh, Ant- yeah. A Thousand Plateaus, rather. Yeah, I said read, read cheekily. Because I, I, I meant read the, of the refrain, right? So, but, yeah. Let me just say that there are serious problems with string theory. There's a wonderful physicist, Sabine Hassenfelder. Do you know her? Not I, familiar, no. yes, Sabine Hassenfelder is a German physicist. She has a fantastic YouTube channel called Science Without the Gobbledygook. She has a wonderful book on mathematics and how the emphasis on beauty in mathematics misled physics. Interesting. And string theory is one of the victims of that emphasis because theoretically, it's very beautiful. Elegant, elegant universe. I mean, that's what Brian Greene's book, I think, was titled, or yeah, if I'm not mistaken. So a lot of books, but unfortunately, and people like Lee Smolin have given n number of lectures and as well written in almost all of his books. He has a book called The Trouble with Physics. I believe that's yeah. Smolin's book in which he says, you know, we've wasted 30 years and billions of dollars on this theory. Gotten us nowhere. So. It might not be a popular thing to say among certain crowds, and certainly my information comes not from my own work, which I have no capacity to do, but from these people who are, I believe, experts in the field, and this is what they say, and I read their books, and I follow their arguments and their ideas. I put a lot of store in what they say. I did want to go back to time for just a second, and Merleau Ponty, because I, you mentioned the edited collections, and I noticed you had, you had several edited collections specifically on phenomenology, feminist phenomenology, whether it be Time, Merleau-Ponty. You mentioned, obviously, before the show that all of your books and all of your writing is informed by your own sort of particular feminist point of view, which is very clear, it's, say, in the in the introduction to Deleuze and the Ruin of Representation, where you cite, or, you know, you kind of mention some of the thinkers you're going to bring in line with Deleuze, not the least of whom are Rigori and, and some mm-hmm. others. Do you want to just say maybe a little bit about how that informs your work, mm-hmm. whether it be feminist phenomenology or feminism as you see it? Based on what you just said, it makes me think that may, it gives me the notion, and I think it's true, that most of my overtly feminist work has been in phenomenology. Okay. Why? Because I could work with Beauvoir, Rigori, other feminist phenomenologists, you know, Gail Weiss, who and I did the edited collection on feminist readings of feminist readings of Meloponti and time in feminist phenomenology, and you know, three or four books that are feminist phenomenological edited collections. And so, you know, I feel like I've been able to contribute the most to explicitly to feminist theory through phenomenology. That's where the conversation is, by and large. It's not to say that there isn't a feminist conversation in Deleuze, Mm -hmm. but, you know, I have a section of one of these books on Alice in Wonderland, and I just think he's got it so wrong. Interesting. (laughs) I have to go back and find that now. (laughs) You know? And I published it as a separate paper. Like, no, 
Uh uh-uh. uh. And there are much more interesting readings of that through. I actually use philosophy of language because, after all, Lewis Carroll was a logician. Yes. And it was yes. my argument that he was using that book, yes, to entertain little girls, but also to put out various paradoxes, yes. logical paradoxes that had not yet been fully articulated within the logic community. And I think it's a much better reading than this this stuff that Deleuze says about the depths and boys who are pigs. I just think it's awful. Yeah. It's terrible. Yes. <laughs> you know, it's like, what was he thinking? Why did he do that? You know, he should have stopped with, you know, logic of sense where it's good. It's really good. But all that other stuff, it's like, no, sorry, doesn't doesn't work for me. I've also done I have a, a section of, I think it's in the universal mm-hmm. on the core. Demeter, Hor, Persephone, a rigorized reading. And I have my own take on that using physics and light theories of light. I prefer mine to her psychoanalytic reading. I mean, there's nothing wrong with what she says, but I, I think that I was able to bring out something that, at least for me, was more interesting and useful. So, you know, I've always written overtly feminist papers, but, you know, different audiences, different orientations. That paper on Irigra and Bergson has gotten a lot of reads, just resonates with people. I'm not even entirely, I don't know if I would write it the same way anymore, Mm -hmm. but, you know, it's opened up a conversation. That's fine. And as you said, you know, if if it's not overt, you can, you can kind of maybe smuggle it in and, and, and get people uh, seduced behind their backs without knowing. Right. Sometimes, yeah, yeah, sometimes it works. Yeah. yeah sometimes uh, uh, you got a, a little subtlety helps. So um, I did find that fascinating And it. What I really appreciated is the fact that, you know, as you said, you kind of started with phenomenology and yet we're able to appreciate Deleuze who also kind of has this, I don't want to say paradoxical, but he has an interesting relationship with someone like Husserl who comes up at, at interesting points through, you know, not just in difference repetition, logic of sense, but even at the end, what is philosophy? And it's not, he's not a great enemy like Hegel. There is this, I think Deleuze even, I swear he says it perhaps in what is philosophy where he's asking this question about phenomenology for maybe it's for concept creation or something like this, but he hasn't necessarily fully ruled it out, even if he's got his own biases. I think he admires Husserl greatly. There are a few points where he departs from Husserl, Mm. but the whole notion of the importance of abstraction, that's all from Husserl. You know, I think the only phenomenologist, quasi-phenomenologist that Deleuze is really harsh to and well-deserved is Roy. Oh, okay. Okay. I was I was gonna say he's he's not too kind of Heidegger, but maybe he's more neutral and just kind of You know, of... I wrote this thing on feminist phenomenologists, philosophers of science, mm-hmm. and I reviewed the work of I should write all these names down and have them in front of me. <laughs> it's fine. You read that article, you'll see there's a little It'll come around, but I I can't keep this many things in my head. I reviewed the work of a Canadian woman. See, I know, and I know what she looks like, Mm -hmm. (laughs) who is a um, Heideggerian philosopher of science. And it made me see that there's more Heidegger in Deleuze than I expected, but it's very ephemeral. There's no direct quotation, but Somebody I saw just put out a book on Heidegger and Deleuze. It's probably right, you know, as long as they're not saying that Deleuze is a Heideggerian. He's not, yes. you know, yeah. that's I mean, I mean, I think the Bicycle has the book on Heidegger and Deleuze, but that was from 20 years ago or so. Yeah, and, and it, because he was a Heideggerian. Yeah, exactly. So, he you know, a there's it's more on Heidegger than Deleuze. There's a, there was a, a quote that I, I had from what is philosophy that I thought was it really kind of resonated with. Was this it? Yeah, I, I just wanted to read it real quickly to get your thoughts because. Yeah, can I read it, it? Yes, please. Okay. If philosophy has a fundamental need for the science that is contemporary with it, this is because science constantly intersects with the possibility of concepts. And because concepts necessarily involve allusions to science that are neither examples nor applications nor either reflections, 
Conversely, are there functions, properly scientific functions of concepts? This amounts to asking whether science is, as we believe, equally and intensely in need of philosophy, but only scientists can ask the <laughs> question. So true. It reminded me of sort of one of the threads throughout your work, not just in the latest work, but even something like the beginning of postmodern philosophy, where you are kind of, obviously you discuss like the SoCal uh, pokes and... Um, Which which, you know, there was way too much silence about and still is needed to be brought into the light. There is a point at to, even if I think they're, what, SoCal and Breach Mall, their book on fashionable nonsense, I think a lot of it's a little overstated. It got a little too much interest, but there is something there to it where it is this question of, obviously, philosophers can either appropriate science or try to dictate to science what to do, like you can think of Kahn as, as metaphys- metaphysics as the queen of the sciences, or even Heidegger is wanting to sort of provide an ontological foundation for the sciences. So there is a sense and there's a kind of rivalry going on there. But on the other hand, it does seem, especially today, more and more, perhaps scientists are dismissive of philosophy. And I, I was wondering what you think about depends. that tension. Depends? Yeah, it depends. Like the physicists who interest me, especially those who have to do with the Perimeter Institute in Canada, Waterloo. Also, the multidisciplinary scientists at the Santa Fe Institute who Mm -hmm. created complexity science, which is another big interest of mine. I'm part of a complexity group at my university. I would say that among some scientists, there's much less hostility than there used to be. Even my beloved Sabine Hassenfelder, who used to be quite negative about philosophy, has backed off a little bit. Fascinating. She has, yeah, she has a, a recent, just like in the last week or two, and I was teaching Heidegger about a video called Nine Levels of Nothing. It was such good timing. <laughs> and the last two are actually philosophical. There are reasons for this. For example, the Perimeter Institute in Canada is closely affiliated with Western University, which is one of the strongest philosophy of science programs anywhere, maybe, you know? And a lot of the philosophers of science are very, very schooled in physics, knowledgeable in physics and formalist mathematics, like that grad student who I used to talk to all the time when I had the project. <laughs> I was actually part of the philosophy of science institute i wasn't in the philosophy department at western when i had the interesting fellowship there i was in and they brought me in thinking i was going to do ethics <laughs> instead i was doing formalism <laughs> that was really more fun than i can possibly explain you know but i learned so much from them i'm so grateful and bill harper who is their top most famous philosopher of science he's a newtonian scholar mm. uh, he was just so great to me. And, and just, you know, when I was writing, I forget one of those books, he was writing a book on Newton and empiricism. And he sent me the first chapter of it, for which I was incredibly grateful because I needed, I needed something, you know, really solid to work with. Yes. And then there's the whole Santa Fe Institute thing. Now, a lot of those people are, are doing, they started out doing physics economics and computer science. And then there's people like Stuart Kaufman, who is an evolutionary biologist, who is one of my all-time favorites in the world. And um, no, it's a little less interesting to me because there's a lot, you know, complexity theory. It's like everything and nothing. I'm kind of like, but you know, there are people like Melanie Mitchell, who's a philosopher at the University of Oregon, I think is where she is, or University of Washington, one of those places. And she's an affiliate with the Perimeter Institute. She has a pretty good book, book a readable, very accessible book on complexity and another one on AI. They're good books. They're very, mm-hmm. and she writes them so they're accessible. So, you know, I think there's, a, it depends on who you ask. I'm sure if you ask Sokol and <laughs> those, people <laughs> they'll say why waste your time yeah and but, it's- you know given the level of questioning due to entanglement theory entanglement it's not just a theory entanglement in quantum physics which einstein podolsky and rosen tried to disprove and in right tried- disprove it they proved it or at least formulated an experiment that could be done to prove it and now has been done 
to everyone's amazement, if not satisfaction. Uncertainty is a bigger thing. You can think about some of the greatest scientists have also been philosophical, but as you point out and is kind of well known, it's the increasing specialization that science kind of necessitates, if not well, uh, and the isolation that we philosophers, yes, and I'm sorry to point fingers, but Heidegger didn't help. Science was not an acceptable way to do philosophy from the pre Socratics to now, it was always, it was always there, and philosophers were making use of it. And now, particularly at places like Perimeter and Western University in Canada, I think that physicists are using the work of philosophers because those philosophers, they really do understand physics. They're trained. Yeah. Physics, a lot of them have physics PhDs and then they go into philosophy, you know, that's, that's like normal. So maybe it's hard for a lot of us who don't have the background, but even someone like me, you know, who had to do it from scratch using books that do not have a lot of complex equations. There is a point every now and then where I could follow the equations, but you have to work with it every day. Otherwise yeah. you lose it like anything else. Totally you, agree with that. You got to work with it every day. And the other thing is that like philosophy, science has a different language for every kind of physics that you're doing. The languages they use are, each one has a different language. So there's no one language of science either, just like there's no one language of philosophy. I really like that as a, maybe as a, as a way of sort of uh, getting into the outro. Before we do that and sort of ask what you're working on now and in the future, I wanted to give my colleague another chance to, because <laughs> I know, I, again, I hog the time. I'm the black hole that... that <laughs> That sucks in all the uh, all the information and the light. I did want because I know how excited we both were to have you here, and and I appreciate you immensely for for just sharing with us and enlightening us, and obviously for your for your work. But I did want to give him another chance Boy, to be able to talk to you both about it. So I thank you. We always hope that our guests have fun. So that's that's part of it. Is we get excited, we we share ideas. We vibe, if you will, for going back to maybe some quantum stuff. But yeah, um, <laughs> nice. Did, did you have one, anything else you wanted to? Uh... Oh gosh, there's so much, but um, I don't even know if there. I can think of anything other than maybe. Well, I hate to open a can of worms, but um, good. You know, <laughs> <laughs> she's ready. She's ready for you. You know, one thing that maybe I could bring to bear would be when you were discussing the light cones and Bergson. I was thinking about how that sort of felt a little bit analogous to to Leibniz and the singularities. And to give some additional context, I've been having this, just in looking at logic of sense and kind of the differential calculus and thinking about Leibniz, I've had this idea that there's a relationship between like the partial objects on the body without organs and the singularities, because they're sort of, they're sort of points that are not necessarily, you know, they're not full holes or they're not universals but they have like these little perspectives on on the whole or the universal i don't know if that stokes any this is highly speculative so i don't know if this is your cup of tea but i don't know if you have a response or if i can help maybe shape that question or statement a little bit better to I, I, first of all i love yeah. leibniz between the you know are you spinoza or are you leibniz i'm leibniz <laughs> so no worries there but the Singularity, that's a very specific thing, okay? It is the... Or maybe, what is it, the monads? I may be... But, that's uh, Leibniz's language, yes. I might be messing up the terminology, so forgive me. So which do you mean? <laughs> We've been trying to think of uh, of them together, but it, a lot of it came together when we were discussing sort of Deleuze's critique of Leibniz insofar oh, as... You mean our monad singularities? I think that that's part of it, it whether or not if I can possible uh, <laughs> I mean each and every each and every monad I, I've never thought about that but each and every monad reflects the entire 
cosmos or universe from its own point of view, right? reflecting what's closest to it most clearly, what's furthest away most vaguely, I would say not necessarily a singularity, possibly more akin to the light cone. The thing about a singularity is and I don't know, I guess it depends on how you would interpret a moment, right. because singularities are governed by attractors, and the attractor orients the singularity in a certain way without it ever fully reaching completion. So that's kind of a messy yes. thing in there. I, maybe that's where I was, maybe I was just think, being too literal in terms of partial object in that sense. I'm not sure. But you know, <laughs> this makes me think, though, that the latest discovery about the local not being real or you i think it came out what this recently in scientific american the nobel prize for the nobel prize winning physicists they had basically yeah that's the 50 cent breakdown of it is that yeah the the local is not real the local is sort of an illusion i'd have to look in the article you mean the whole question of entanglement i assume action that's what it is dis- spooky action at a distance is that what you're talking about let me look at <laughs> As opposed to localized causality, which Einstein was insisting on that all all causal all causal relations are local. I mean, the, the solution to the entanglement question. Yeah, the solution to the entanglement question. We're not talking about causality. We're talking about something else. Gotcha. Because one way of understanding it is. A lot of the people who write about it, the physicists who write about it, they say, if you sent a shoe from the right foot to one end of the universe and a shoe from the left foot to the other end of the universe, and you opened up one of the shoe boxes, you'd immediately know what the other shoe is. Ta-da! You know? <laughs> so there's a kind of, they're entangled from the beginning. So it's not that they're not originally entangled might be too strong a word, not that they're not originally affiliated, not yeah. originally associated in some way. I don't, I'm not using the right language here, I know, but they always already are. So to claim that we only have, and local physical causality, what is that? I mean, the universe consists of atoms and gazillions of subatomic particles and, you know, my favorite being the neutrinos that are passing through us by the billions right? as we speak. This is takes us into the whole question of materialism, which seems to me to be a fraught theory. Just saying. <laughs> <laughs> it also, you know, it does, though, kind of give credence to this notion, especially in the universal that I think I really appreciated was the way you were kind of continually trying to articulate the, uh, I don't want to call it Delizian because that's just maybe redundant, but this notion of, of sort of starting with the pre-individual and the impersonal and emphasizing that as your framework, rather than starting with an I, with a me, with a you, with these molar global persons, sort of doing it the other way around. And I think that that is what I actually really appreciated about it because it, it seems much more in tune with and sensitive to sort of what Deleuze is trying to articulate so much in his difference repetition, logic of sense, this view from sort of the other way around, from the bottom up, if you will. Well, a vulnerable sensibility is a crowd phenomena. It's not an individual, which is an abstract, atomistic, Newtonian entity. And I constantly, when I teach this, say, you know, why do you want to be an individual? It just means that you have the exact same characteristics as everybody else. You know, it's a way of atomizing all of us rather than emphasizing uniqueness, which someone like Hannah Arendt does in her work. There's no emphasis on what is unique, on natality as that uniqueness. The whole idea of becoming and being an individual or individualistic is it's very Newtonian. And Elizabeth and, Del- and, and Adam Smith and yeah, all those folks, Locke, right? R- right, exactly. Deleuze and Guattari are constantly talking about the individual as the perfectly situated level for Oedipus, for capitalism, for yeah. for that kind of. I mean, Guattari even talks about refrains that are sort of commercialized for the individual because of a molar level. And, and so I think that for them, that's part of the danger. And you you rightly point that out as this kind of tension between what Deleuze may or may not call pure eminence or, or eminence and sort of transcendence 
always sinking back in. And I, I guess that's why I kind of appreciated that point of view, which may or may not be too literary for some, but at least deserved that different mode of exposition. So I'm hoping that you flirt with that again in the future and try to, as you say, write philosophy as you've always wanted to with whether it be poetic license or literary flair, whatever you want to call it, but in your own way. And to that end, I'm kind of curious if you want to tell us a little bit about, you've told us some of your recent publications and there are a few of them I already want to read and go back to, but (laughs) do you have any current future projects that you want to sort of let us ruminate on? Well, the Time is Real essay, a version of it, a much later version, is in the edited collection that Dan Smith co-edited with his former student, I think. They've done really nice work on it. I'm very appreciative to be part of that volume. What I've been working on the last couple of years, other than postmodernism, which I hope I'm done with, I might not be. I mean, I like it, but there's a point where, you know, you hit as a methodology, it's kind of depressing. It's had its moments, particularly in the arts and architecture, Mm -hmm. but in philosophy, it's kind of a downer. (laughs) (laughs) It's the Um, evil Leotard period, right? No, there's no evil Leotard. Leotard warned us about postmodernism. Yes. He gave his heart and soul to making us understand what was visiting us. Yeah. And nothing but praise for him. More the, where is Baudrillard going to finally end up? Yeah. <laughs> Even Baudrillard, I ended up appreciating his book, America. You know, I think he probably got it right there. It's a pretty yeah. interesting little book. And it has pictures. <laughs> <laughs> As for where I'm trying to go, I'm working with teaching and reading. I've been on this whole thing between emotions and cognition, doing it for a couple of years. And I've come across some new material recently. I don't know why I never saw it before, but it's very interesting. Like some scholars in the area will mention, refer to others, and some will ignore them, will ignore them, the very same ones who are talking about them. So there's obviously some competition there. And I'm not talking about philosophers here. I'm actually talking about neuropsychoanalysts. Okay. Okay. Neuropsychoanalysts. And, you know, we know people like Damasio, for instance, but he's just the tip of the iceberg. And I've always found his work only partly convincing, although I've taught it. But there are others who are who dig much deeper and whose work I am trying to use First of all, I want to dig deeper into the relationship between the limbic system, which is the site of affective life, Mm -hmm. and actually the site, according to the neuropsychoanalysts who do use Freud, they don't shun him because they know he was he was doing science. Yes, he was yeah. And they don't they don't trivialize it. They use Freud in very good ways, in ways that I always thought Freud should be used. And I did write an essay on Freud and trauma in a book on trauma that states that it's quite old, actually. So I'm probably pull back, pull up some of that stuff. But I am really interested in this idea that consciousness is actually in the brainstem and not in the cortex and what that means philosophically and what that means in terms of behavior. So that's going to be a couple of years of looking. (laughs) That's Yeah, that's an intense project. It's not small. And trying to figure out how to use that stuff. But I'm really enthusiastic about it. It ties in with the work I've done on Bergson from the beginning. I use Deleuze and my interest in Meloponti as well. It all fits together. And the literature I read and cite, it's all intertwined, as Mel Ponty would say. Honestly, that's fascinating because it becomes more complex going from sort of the brain as as a kind of privileged image, right? This interface or, or this frame that, to then say, well, where exactly when it gets down to the, the neurobiological, that's, that's fascinating just to think. And for me, this is all connected to complexity theory. So much of complexity has gone in the direction of AI. I want to take it in a different direction. It makes sense why then you would be teaching these courses on cognition and emotion. And I think that bringing in the phenomenology might actually be helpful. Yeah, it's useful. 
the current cognitive theoretic use of phenomenology is this extended cognition. That's not really how I see it. They have a whole school of thought and it's good. I'm sure there's something important that they're point dealing with, pointing out, but it's not exactly what interests me. You follow your follow your your lines of flight, if you will. You know, you follow your your path and I will say one thing, I'm still kind of caught in the middle between Spinoza and Leibniz. I'm not exactly sure where to, where to fall there, but I'm glad that you, you've staked your claim. And so I feel like now I've got to revisit that. But there were a lot, of, a lot of the papers you cited. Once we listen back, I'm definitely going to ask you if I can't find them. <laughs> if, I can't, if I can't pirate them online, I'm going to ask you uh, First, kindly. I'm happy for, to send you anything. Yeah. Yeah. I think that uh, we, can, we can wrap up our show. Coop, do you want to send us out? Once again, thanks to Dorothea Okowski for joining Taylor and I on this week's edition of the Machinic Unconscious Happy Hour. The very rules of evil, of negativity and singularity, including the ultimate form of singularity, which is unconscious character. The whole state of things, the pure violence without object. This is the typical violence of information. It's violent because what happens there is a murder of the real, the vanishing point of reality. Let's not have a misunderstanding here. With nothing left but recycled, whitewashed, lobotomized people, as in a clockwork orange. <laughs>